with uh, Simon C. Dag Montefiore, if I'm saying that correctly, and uh, to celebrate his new book, The World, A Family History of Humanity. It just came out last week from Knopf, Prost, not Knopf, I think it's Knopf. Um, and it's, it's, you know, you haven't been too many places or seen too many reviews. I mean, this is really fresh off the press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very fresh here. Yeah. yeah, and in England it came out. Um, in England it came out, um, <coughs> in England it came out in October, and it's been out in Spain and Holland. Okay. And so that's sort of South America. Uh, I've been in Africa, I've launched it in India. So we're really behind things. Well, America's a little behind, I'm usually, in this case, yes. But, um, but it's great, I, I must say, it's great to be here. I mean, it's great to be here with you in this very famous bookshop. Well, thank you. Which I've heard so much about from all sorts of, all sorts of friends who yeah. Thank you. Well, um, so, uh, I think most of many would agree Kanaf is the most distinguished publisher in print in this country. Um, his, uh, C. previous books have been published in 48 languages, including Catherine the Great and Potemkin, uh, Jerusalem, which was a global uh, bestseller and winner of the Jewish Book Council Book of the Year, uh, the Romanovs, Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar, um, which was awarded the History Book of the Year at the British Book Awards, Titans of History, The Giants Who Made Our World, Voices of History, Speeches That Changed the World, uh, Young Stalin, an uh, LA Times Book of the Year, Written in History, Letters That Changed the World, and just for the heck of it, the acclaimed Moscow Trilogy of Novels, Sashinska, Red Sky Moon, and One Night in Winter. As I say, uh, The World was released here just a few days ago. Most reviews are yet to come at 1,300 pages. Some reviewers are no doubt still at it. But it comes with credible endorsements from, among others, uh, Henry Kissinger, who was a source, someone you interviewed uh, for, for material, uh, Ben Oakry, Simon Shama, and General David Petraeus, uh, who said that the book is brilliant in its examination of our species' experiences through the prism of family is truly inspired. Seabag uh, received his PhD from Cambridge and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, which I understand gives you good seats at the coronation. <laughs> so, uh, please join me in welcoming Simon <laughs> Thank you. I've just got a few questions, then I'm turning it over to uh, either the audience for, for whatever questions you might have. Uh, a family history of humanity, I like the idea. How did that come to you, first of all, and how did you find the study of the family as a beneficial way to approach history? Well, that, that's, that's, that's the key question. Um, of course, this has been a, um, I think as you appreciate, a totally insane project. <laughs> and um, and, you know, and I, I, I also know that you and many others here will know how, how publishing works. And um, after I did my History of Jerusalem, which was a sort of history of the world, um, I suddenly thought like it would be a great idea to do a, his, a, history, a real history of the world and to expand the idea. And, um, and I was looking for something in particular. Um, that, I, that, I, that I wanted to find, and that is that, you know, you know many world histories um, are um, expansive, um, uh, but somewhat distant from the, huma the humans that you're writing about. There are a lot of commodities and inventions and new religions and new empires and rises and falls and migrations and the old earthquake and pandemic, um, but, but what's missing often are the people. And so, um, and so I, I'd always noticed that. I'm also a huge fan of biography, and I love biography. But biographies are getting bigger and bigger, as you must have noticed in your shelves. I mean, Neil Ferguson's new biography of Henry Kissinger is a thousand pages before Kissinger met Nixon. And, um, you know, Stephen Copkin's brilliant biography of Stalin is 
you know, now onto its third volume, it will be 4,000 pages in total. Um, and Roberts's Winston Churchill is exactly the same length as this, in fact. And yet I've got Winston Churchill and John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough, and all the other Churchills, too, in mine. So, um, so that was the idea. I wanted to, I wanted to find a book um, that combined the two. And um, I looked around, I couldn't find it. And I always followed the dictum of my hero, Benjamin Disraeli, who said, um, when, I want to, when I want to read a book and I can't find it, I write it. And so, um, and Benjamin Disraeli is, of course, a big character in the book. So, so I, I wanted to try and do it like that. So I wrote a proposal to the publisher, which was about a paragraph long, and they commissioned it. And then about a year later, they said, uh, how's the book going? And that's the trouble with these, that's the trouble with these things. You have to write the damn thing. Um, so then I began to think of a way to do it, and I, it came to me that family was the way to do it. If it could work, no one had ever done it before, which is always something fun to do. And it also would certainly be the most challenging, a challenge, incredibly challenging thing to try. And, um, and so I began to lay out the key families that could be the center of this book, the mega families. And so I, I, worked, I mapped out that one, one family could cover the whole of European history, starting with um, Clovis and then the Merovingians and then um, the Pepinids and Charlemagne and all the way through the Habsburgs to 1918. So that was Europe. Far East, well, you know, if you had Genghis Khan starting in about 1100, his family, going through Tamerlane, all the way through to the Mughals, that was another sort of, that's another thousand years, basically, of, of Asia. And then, of course, the other mega family is the family of the, of the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad. And that's another family that you know, have three or four great dynasties that ruled up the whole Middle East, and then go all the way up to the Hashemites of Jordan today. And so it's, so I realized that it could work. In, in the course of uh, studying <coughs> these families, did, did you find uh, people who were, you thought perhaps previously were minor characters who turned out to be more important? Yeah, you're gonna ask me the examples of those, but. <laughs> But basically, um, but basically, yes, lots of those. And but the real challenge, you know, was it was was actually in writing, you know, in, in, then in writing the book, because of course to do it fully properly, it which I wanted to do, it had to be one volume. Um, but it turned out to be incredibly complex, complicated process, and it and I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it almost killed me uh, <laughs> writing this book. It was the most um, the delicious and satisfactory. Because of the fascinating characters I, you know, I, I, I researched and and the different subjects I researched, and I always really wanted to write this book, and it is the culmination of my life, but it was also the most daunting. And I often thought of Sima Qian, the first century um, Chinese historian who was writing the history of the world. I mean, the, the Chinese—that's the history of China, of course. Um, but he was writing the history of the world when he fell out with the emperor. And the emperor, um, the emperor, the emperor gave him a, a, a sort of a terrible, um, indecent proposal, an indecent choice, execution or castration. And um, he, he chose castration because he wanted to finish his book. And, um, and I, I kept his letter where he said, you know, I've chosen this terrible mutilation so that, I, so that my book can be read in different distant countries um, in different villages across the seas, um, by the Mississippi, you know, um, that was the point. And, um, and so he chose to do, and he, he was castrated, he survived. Very few people, there's a lot of castration in the book, by the way, which is really unexpected in a family history. But, um, but you'll be surprised by the number of, um, the number of uh, eunuchs who, who founded dynasties, but that's another story. Um, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, so I kept that letter by my, by my, by my table, my table as I was, um, as I was writing. And I was just determined to uh, finish the book. And yes, I would have undergone any torture. Yes, even that, to finish this damn book. And, um, but you'll be pleased to hear that I, I did finish it intact. Um, <laughs> now here I am. And do you get much into sort of comparative analysis of these uh, uh, central figures or uh, 
families, and uh, I'm wondering specifically about uh, what's your take on uh, Khrushchev and Brezhnev and Putin sort of comparing? Yeah, well, there's a lot of Russia. Um, I, I absolutely do. And there's a lot of Russia in the book, of course, and Ukraine. And the book finishes on the on the day that um, Putin invades Ukraine, very recently, a year, just over a year ago. Um, but Russia, Russia and Ukraine are all the way through. And yes, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated with all those Soviet characters as a biographer of Stalin. And um, and I do look closely at Brezhnev, Khrushchev. Um, when Khrushchev seized power, he considered having Brezhnev. I mean, he, when Brezhnev seized power, he considered having Khrushchev assassinated or executed. Um, he was so far fed up with him. But on the other hand, he was terrified of Khrushchev and wrote false diary entries hope, just to cover himself in case he was caught, um, saying how wonderful Khrushchev was and how innocent he was about everything, um, which wouldn't have worked um, in the toils of the KGB, of course. But, um, but actually, you know, it, they're, they're interesting characters. I mean, Putin is a particularly fascinating character for us today. And I, I, I had some sort of dealing, I never met him, um, but I've had some dealings with him because when I finished my first history book, um, which was Catherine the Great of Potemkin, um, his staff, his, I, I was approached by the staff of this new, liberalizing, reforming, optimistic, hopeful Russian leader, Vladimir Putin. Um, this was 23 years ago. And, um, and I was approached by, um, approached by the staff, and they said, you know, as you know, um, Catherine the Great and Potemkin are hardly covered by Soviet, ol Soviet ologists, um, Soviet historians. Um, they've basically been kind of forbidden for 70 years. So there aren't really any new books about them. Could you write a one-pager? Because um, a certain personage in the Kremlin, who's new to the Kremlin, wants to know how they annexed Crimea and really? took um, Ukraine. And... Um, and so I wrote a one-pager for, for him. And later, when George W. Bush visited um, the Hermitage Museum, visited the Winter Palace, and went around the museum, um, you know, both, he, he'd also read my book, um, Catherine the Great Potemkin, by a sort of chance. And so when he arrived, and, and, and Putin said, what do you want to see? He said, I want to see pictures, um, portraits of Prince Potemkin. And um, Putin said, most people want to see um, Peter the Great or whatever. Um, he said, but I'm also very interested in, in, um, in Potemkin. So they went off to see Potemkin. And later, um, he, I, I, I was approached again by his people, and they said, um, he's read the book, and he's fascinated with the book, and, he, and he's, he's, he admires you because you've, you've um, rehabilitated two great Russian figures. You know, Catherine the Great is normally presented um, as a sort of nymphomaniac, slightly joke figure. And Potemkin is often presented as creating false villages, hence Potemkin villages. So um, you, you've, you've made, you've, you know, you've, you've presented them as kind of titans, as they should be. And the president would like to know, would you like, a, would you like a reward? So I said, sure. You know, no one turns down a reward from the Kremlin. Um, so he said, would you be interested in working, be the first person to work on the archives? personal archives of Stalin. So, um, so that book became Stalin the Court of the Red Tsar, which is one of my one of my earlier books, my second book. But the reason why Catherine the Great and Potemkin were so uh, are so important is because they, you know, they did actually take Kremlin, they did take um, Crimea, they founded the Black Sea Fleet. I mean Potemkin built Sebastopol, you know, which is Putin's great prize in Crimea, the naval base. He founded Odessa, he founded Mariupol, he founded Kherson. All the places that are now being fought over are actually towns founded from scratch by Prince Potemkin, who's one of the great figures. Yes, a Russian imperialist, but still an amazing figure, who, by the way, would loathe Putin and all Putin stands for, uh, because, well, for all sorts of reasons. But first of all, he was a child of the Enlightenment, who believed in the Enlightenment. And so when um, Putin took Kherson, the city of Kherson, which you probably followed in the, the, you know, last year, 
Um, he came into possession of Potemkin's body, which is in the tomb in, um, in, in Hirsan. And when the Russians retreated, they stole the body of Prince Potemkin, obviously on Putin's orders. And I think what, that will, what will happen to Potemkin's body is that he will create, one day he will create a huge mausoleum for Potemkin in Moscow with the names of all the cities that Potemkin founded in Ukraine. So there's a little story. Uh, we were talking just uh, moments before you started, you were talking about how important uh, music was between 1950 and 2000. And I know that here you talk about uh, the Rolling Stones' sympathy for the devil as the greatest history song ever. Yeah. How was that? Well, I'm willing to debate this <laughs> with anybody here who wants to challenge it. I mean, some people, I, I often been challenged by people, so how can you say that Rasputin's the greatest? Ra Ra Rasputin by Boney M is the greatest history song. And there are lots of more recent ones, of course. I mean, you know, there's Kings and Queens by Ava Max, for example. You know, there are, there are um, White Le Jean's got a great book, uh, his song called Historia. There's, there's tons of sort of, um, the, you know, Stranglers, No More Heroes, you may know. There are tons of them. I've created, because um, I was this, when I was listening to the, the, the when I was writing the book, I, I listened to music terribly loudly, which is unusual for a writer, I think. But it's just for the energy, you know, for the purposes of energy, kind of velocity of writing. And so then I began to think, like, actually, um, these songs are kind of fun because there are certain songs that, that are history, I call history songs. And I define that in two ways. Uh, history songs are either songs that sing about a historical character, um, as in Sympathy for the Devil, um, or, or The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down by Joan Baez is a really, another superb one. Um, all their songs have become historical um, because um, they're, 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 they're the sort of anthem for a revolution, for example. So, for example, Bayan in the Iranian song is the song of the Iranian revolution now. So that's in there. So in the end, I decided to create this um, this playlist for the book. It's a Spotify playlist. Um, it's called the playlist for the world, for the world, the book. And it, um, so do look it up. But I've got it in a sort of order. Um, and, and by the way, I've always sort of, I take, I ask for recommendations. And lots of people have sent in recommendations saying you must put this and you must put that in. So please all tell me or write to me on Twitter or whatever, um, any, um, any, anything I've missed out. But there is about 30 hours of music on it now. And, um, and it, the, much of the history, but there are Indian songs, there are Iranian songs, there are Ukrainian songs from the war, um, there are Russian songs, there are songs from the great, from World War II, um, there's a Battle of New Orleans, uh, there's all sorts of amazing music. Um, but, um, and I think, I think Sympathy of the Devil is the number one, by, um, um, partly because um, it's got it's got lots of um, 20th century sort of atrocities in it, you know, the killing of the Tsar, World War II, um, but also because it's so clever. You know, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Um, you know, guess my name. And, it's the, and it's, it never says it's the devil, but, um, but, you know, it's just such a clever novelistic um, a trope and such a clever idea, and it's so beautifully done. So I think that's number one, but I'm willing to be challenged on that. But, uh, but another point is I just was in Graceland today, and um, which was one of the, something I've always wanted to do when I was visiting the tomb of Elvis, and um, as you do when you're in um, as, as you do when you're in Memphis. And I think what you what what, what you what you say is, is is something I agree with that there was a 50-year period uh, between about 1950 and about 2000 before the internet when rock stars were a sort of, um, were a sort of super, super being. They were like, um, in, in the 18th century, or um, dukes in the 18th, in 18th century England, or, um, or, or condottieri, or, or, or cardinals in Renaissance Italy. And they, they were sort of people who um, surpassed class, stood above class, and had a special prestige for all sorts of reasons. Not mere um, troubadours. Not mere troubadours. I mean, not all of them. I, I don't mean all of them, but there are certain ones. I think the Stones, the Beatles, you know, um, Elvis, Sinatra. I mean, Sinatra is really the best example I always give because he had such an astonishing career. I mean, you know, 
that him and the Bobby Soxers right after World War II really invented the, the, com the commercial existence of popular culture, popular music. Um, then he went into Hollywood in the, in the, you know, as Hollywood became, you know, with, the, with the primacy of America, as Hollywood became the international film studio. Um, then he became great friends with Jack Kennedy. He introduced Jack Kennedy to Marilyn Monroe, whom, he, whom he'd had a passing acquaintance with. Um, he introduced, um, he was friends with the Mafia. He sang in Havana in 1946 with for Lucky Luciano and Maya Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. Um, then he introduced Jack Kennedy to Judah Vexner, the, 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 the girlfriend of his, fr of his friend, Sam Jean Carter. Um, then he was dropped by the Kennedys. Um, and then he was then he was best friends with, 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 with Ronald Reagan and organized his inauguration. So an amazing career. So that sort of sums up um, why the chairman of the board, you know, is the ultimate kind of, I mean, I, 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 I guess he's, you might say he's not a rock star, but pop star. And, and why pop stars are important in a world history and why you'll find in this world history, um, you'll find, you'll find, all sorts of actors and actresses, but you'll also find, above all, you'll find these great singers, and you'll find the Stones, you'll find Bowie, you'll find Frank Sinatra, uh, particularly in American, in American life, he's a huge figure. Um, and that's why also the play is just kind of appropriate. So, nice. Yeah. I've got uh, one sort of crystal ball question for you. Uh, you Be the cause of its own extinction, and if so, how soon? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. I mean, in the conclusion, I go into this. Um, well, I mean, one thing that um, one thing that's that's certainly true is that our our ability to self mutilate is limitless. Um, I mean, on the other hand, our ability to adapt and to recreate and to uh, to reposition ourselves is also almost limitless. Um, the question is, has, has it reached its limit? Um, but but um, one thing that, you know, this book starts, starts 900,000 years ago, but it really starts about 10,000 years ago. And the one thing that's constant when you look at the ancient myths, when you go all the way through history, um, as I do, um, through every, every, um, every continent, every culture, every religion, every race, um, every epoch, um, as this book does, um, every, the one thing that's in common, apart from family, is a belief that the world is about to end. Um, and I think there's something very fascinating about the human psychology that, that a, a certain sense of our fragility, a sense of gratitude, a sense of guilt about our total supremacy. Um, I mean, we're the ape that conquered the world, basically. And so I think that's why. But today we have more reason to fear um, than ever before. Um, there are many um, clear and present dangers. Um, uh, there's disease, you know, um, the great triumphs of, of medicine are, are, you know, are now being challenged. Um, antibiotics are working less well. They're also, that, that's one side of things. Um, you know, are we really prepared for another pandemic? Because COVID was just a dress rehearsal for the big respiratory um, pandemic that's may come at some point, it will come one day. Um, uh, there's, there's computers and AI, and I think AI is one of the most terrifying developments, but also one of the most fruitful, potentially. Um, it may cause, it may put a lot of people out of work, it may, it may also enrich, expand, and, and allow people to have amazing leisure and return to their families. Um, there is also, you know, the breakdown of globalization. This sort of war in Ukraine has shown that you know, feeding people may become difficult again. There haven't really been um, the sort of famines that there were before 1900 for 123 years. Um, of course, there were man-made famines in Ukraine, for Stalin in, in Ethiopia. But generally, um, famines became extinct in, um, in, in, in 1900 because of amazing chemical and medical um, developments, which are all in the book, of course. Um, so those are all um, huge dangers. Um, there's climate change, uh, which which um, which is is clearly um, going to change. Even if 
even if it doesn't destroy the world, it's going to change the way the whole world works. And again, that's going to change the way we feed ourselves, and that could lead to floods and famines um, as well. Um, even if yeah, even, and it, and that, that's that's even even if we make, we make massive changes to the way we live, which, by the way, are happening very slowly and you know, may not be enough. Um, so I think there are huge changes ahead. I also think, you know, there's the, there's the breakdown of the law-based world, the rules-based world, as they call it. And with it will come the breakdown of many states that were created in post by the colonial powers, or, or, you know, all, all the United States and Russia. Um, which, were, which were just drawn on a bit of paper. That's including, you know, the, the, the 15 states of the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, for example, and many of the states in Africa, for example, already in East Africa and West Africa and um, Sahel, you're seeing states basically become what I call exurgent warlands, where people just cross the borders. Um, uh, so there's, there's, there's many terrible things afoot, and that's before we even get to nuclear weapons, which um, they're only about it. We, you know, we've actually done pretty well with proliferation in, in, in keeping this genie in the bottle. Um, Dr. Dr. Khan, the, who sold the nuclear secrets to all sorts of countries, has got to be one of the greatest criminals in all of, all of human history. Um, uh, who died quite recently, and, and it is described in the book. But, and he was a Pakistani nuclear scientist. But we've, we've got, a, we've, we're down, to, we're up to about nine nuclear powers now. But that, actually, that's a bit of an illusion because there are about 40 powers that have supposedly civilian nuclear programs. And that means that they could easily get nuclear weapons too. So, I guess, Rather like Chekhov's gun, on, on, you know, when, when Chekhov said, when there's, a, when there's a gun on the wall in a play, you know it's going to be used. Um, you know, some, of these, some, some, sort of these, some sort of weapon will be used one day, for sure. And of course, there's the big struggle coming, developing now, between China and America. Um, so all of these things sound dark. Um, but actually, I, I do believe, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm exactly optimistic, um, but I'm a believer in, 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 in human ingenuity, creativity, and I guess, as a historian of family, love. And I believe that these things, um, that, you know, that these things we, we will muddle through, and we will come through this as we've come through many things before. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, from the audience, anybody have questions? I have a question. Um, yes, Mark. Best question. I've never been asked that question in all my many travels. For the uh, uh, replay, if you could help kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this lady said, it, um, it, is, it, um, is it harder to write about a despicable character um, than, a, than a benign character, or, or, or would you write about them differently? Which is a great question. Um, the answer is with a, with a despicable or a despised character, um, I, I do approach them differently. Um, because I go back to the beginning with them, and I find that a lot of... Actually, I should apply this to both, with all kind of um, legendary characters, let's say, titanic characters that we feel we know, um, I always approach them again, afresh, and start again. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Cleopatra, for example. You know, we're constantly told Cleopatra is this wonderful amazing character, this femin feminist icon. I mean, no one who knows anything about um, Cleopatra could ever regard her as a, as a, as a feminist icon. I mean, she um, murdered her brothers, her sisters. Um, she, she, she based her career on, um, on, on um, hooking up with um, great Roman potentates. She was a slut. Yeah. Not a slut, <laughs> but, but she, she wanted to, she, she was a, she was a ruthless power player, and um, and you know she would she tried to have um, she she used kind of killing wherever possible to sort of seize power. She played Roman politics, which was a messy, messy business. Um, she was a member of 
the Ptolemy family, which were to, you know, relations of Alexander the Great. Um, they were Macedonians, by the way. Um, and, um, you know, from what we know of her, it's hard really to find a particularly admirable character. It's a fascinating character, um, a character who played by the rules of her own world. Um, you know, probably similar to Zenobia, who's another interesting character, a female character. By the way, one of the, one of the, I didn't really explain, but I'd like to say that, you know, one of the reasons that I chose this family approach um, was that, you know, to, it's a way to write about women more. And, you know, women, this is really a, I mean, one reviewer in England said this is really a, a book about, about mothers. You know, it's really about mothers. This, this is a book in praise of mine. There are many mothers in the book, some appalling, some wonderful. I mean, to answer your question, you know, I always try and approach um, despicable characters too, like Hitler or Stalin, um, afresh. And when you read the, when you go back and you, you, read, you read the original sources, you, you begin to understand them more. And so much of what you're told about these people is kind of wrong. Um, I mean, for example, um, with, with, you know, with Hitler and Stalin, you know, I was always told at school that they were kind of mad psychopaths. Um, but, I mean, there are a lot of psychopaths. I mean, every office has about three psychopaths. <laughs> um, so we all know a lot of psychopaths. They don't all come to rule these great empires, um, nor to um, try and change the world by killing millions of innocent women and children. So that isn't a, that isn't a satisfactory analysis. Um, and, you know, other, and, a psych, and in psychopath or in psychological biographies of them, they're always, it's always explained that they were beaten by their drunken fathers, and you know, um, Hitler and Stalin. Well, everyone in the 19th century was beaten by their drunken fathers. <laughs> All fathers were drunken in the 19th century, with a few wonderful exceptions, I'm sure, in your family. Um, but um, but so, um, so that's not a satisfactory way. But then you look at the mothers, the mothers explain everything. And so with Hitler, for example, when I looked into it, I expected to find this kind of persecuted, desperate, bleak childhood. On the contrary, you know, Stalin, um, Hitler was completely indulged and spoiled by his mother, who adored him, let him do anything. Um, and then even then, when she, even when she died, she left him money that enabled him to do nothing for a few more years, not even working. And when that, when that money ran out, then he, became a, then he became something of a sort of hobo, you know, almost a homeless person. Um, but he'd been utterly indulged. His preposterous fantasies of greatness had been indulged by her. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're mothers, don't indulge your children too much. Um, but, um, but, you know, so I try and approach them differently and look at them and try and find, um, just try and uh, wipe the slate clean and approach them afresh. And, um, and so this book is filled with new approaches to everybody, really. Um, and some will surprise you or shock you even, perhaps, because, you know, they are, but it's a, it's a different approach to someone that you feel you know well, and like, you know, like, like Hitler and Stalin, or like Cleopatra. Um, uh, Stalin also had a rather ins kind of inspiring mother, um, but, you know, and, a dr and another drunken father. Yes. Yes, um, one question, you mentioned AI, I was, reading the introduction to your book, and you were talking about the lifetime of reading, study, and travel all contributed to this book. How will generative AI change that where people can take shortcuts and even use material that you wrote in this book probably in the future to copy? So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. All that hard work. Yes, I mean, I think I think um, that's a very good question. So, you know, how will AI affect um, how we write history um, and, and, and all my hard work? Mm -hmm. uh, what will happen to all my hard work in all these books? Great question again. Um, you can get your robot to sue them. I'll get my robot to rewrite their work. Um, um, but actually, to, to, be, to be truthful, I don't think, I don't think AI, I think AI is going to be able to copy people. And of course, lots of writers copy people too. Um, but I don't think it's going to replace writing as such. Or, or, but I, what I do think it's going to do um, is replace all of those professions that are sort of, of which there are now many, um, 
of kind of people moving stuff around the internet and putting it in other places on the internet. And I do think it will, I also think it will put out, put out of work um, people who are working in, or often people who are working in fast food restaurants, for example, things like that. So I think it will cause, it will cause change, you know, because robots will be able to do some of this work. Um, when, when, I, when I was doing my next book, I said, you know, I, I looked into this and I, I sort of worked out there's been a kind of golden period between about another golden period of not, not the rocks, period, not, not the titans of rock, but, you know, a period between about, um, about the Renaissance, roughly, when paper became cheap, and about the 1950s, when everyone got telephones. And um, there was that period, that was a period, a clear period, where everyone wrote all the time, and people, if you read about people that I've studied, places like um, people like Catherine the Great and Frederick the Great and um, Mary Theresa and all these kind of people in the evening, Voltaire, people in the evening, they literally, they, they ruin their eyes writing late into the night. Because rather like us doom scrolling on Twitter, um, it, was a, you know, it was a way to communicate with, with the outside world. And for the first time, you know, if you were someone like Voltaire, you could write a letter that became a sort of newsletter and was repeated and read in drawing rooms all over Europe for the first time. So that was an amazing period for historians. That's, that's, that's my point. Um, so that's why I come to your question. It was a great period for historians. And you know, when you write about politics or gossip, gossip is just private life. When you write about private life, I, I, I write about both. And when you write about these things, you know, nowadays you're, you're sort of guessing when you get when you read stuff online, um, on the mail online. You don't know if it's true or not. But when you have, when, in that 500 years, when you were writing love letters between Catherine the Great and Potemkin, for example, which I worked on a lot, um, you knew they were sleeping together, and and how and how they were sleeping together because they wrote about it. And so we knew. And so when you write about these people, you could write, a, you could really write a full biography. Because in their letters they were talking about everything from, from their hemorrhoids to invading Poland. Um, and, so, and so we knew. And so already with the end of letter writing, um, we began to, uh, the, the, the ride with the telephone. I saw it myself with Stalin's papers. Because once the telephone line was put, into, put in between him and Moscow and his country houses uh, in the south, he stopped... Um, he stopped writing letters. Before then, he wrote hundreds of letters a day, some of them just notes, and I've read them all, many of them. And then, then you, suddenly, you literally see a moment like that when the telephone's put in, and you suddenly, suddenly the letters just literally go down by about 90%, because he phones people. So that's, it's already started. And then, then you get to the stage by the, by the 1990s when people are doing emails, and so that, and, and WhatsApp and everything, and that also replaces and texting, and that replaces letter writing, though it's a new sort of writing, and with its own art forms. Um, the problem is we can never get it, unless the CIA or the FSB harvest our, our data, which is, we don't want that either. Um, I, I, I know, when I, I've known a few kind of prime ministers and um, those sort of the leaders, and they all tell me now, and I also understand this is true from Putin, that they've ceased, um, they've ceased using writing on letters, secret stuff, and they, they, sorry, they've ceased using WhatsApp and, and emails, and they've gone back to writing on bits of paper now, which is interesting. Um, so in a sense, the sort of biography, it's not AI that's going to destroy Barbara Duray, that's already happened, and people will not be able to write the sort of stuff I've written in here in the future in the same way, because they won't have a hundred, they'll have people saying I was there and I saw them and they said this to me, but you won't have actual the words written down. And as for the sort of, you know, writing this book, um, I was very lucky in the last 50 years, I'm 57, in the last sort of um, 40 years, um, I've seen a lot of things myself in world history. I was, I was, I was a war correspondent in the fall of the Soviet Union. And I do believe that every historian who writes at world history should see with his own eyes a great empire falling. And I've seen that, which is something. And I've known many, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning some of these characters, um, yeah, Kissinger and, and Petraeus and um, Shimon Peres and Shevardnadze and 
all sorts of English prime ministers, and Margaret Thatcher. Um, I'm very lucky to know these people. And, in, in, and some of the, I, I interviewed Margaret Thatcher when I was 17 in Downing Street. But Kissinger, I, I know, I've met, at dinner, I've met at many dinners. And I didn't, I've never actually interviewed him. Um, but I've talked to him. And what, what was rather fun about Kissinger was since I knew him, he is 100, and he's 99. But since, since I knew him, I wrote to him and I said, listen, your period, which is, um, since, you're, since I know you, um, I might as well get you to check your period. Uh, doesn't mean I have to take his, his, his changes, of course. But I said, will you just, will you, you know, it's rather like asking kind of Metternich to read the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> you know? So I sent him a note, and actually I got these amazing notes back from him. Um, he didn't try and, he didn't try and rewrite or change or obscure anything, actually, but he corrected a few dates that I've got wrong. But he also kind of, um, you know, wrote, wrote kind of amazing comments like, yeah, I don't remember Chairman Mao. Uh, talking about that, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and all these things. So, you know, it was amazing. So I literally thought, like, oh my God, I've got, you know, it's like, it's like getting, it's like getting kind of, you know, Kaunitz or Bismarck to sort of correct your passage on the unification of Germany. So that was amazing. And I've been, I've been really lucky. I talked to a lot of these people. You know, I once talked to Boris Berezovsky, um, you know, the, the Russian oligarch who was very influential in the 90s who ended up either hanging himself or being assassinated by Putin. And I remember, and these are all conversations that I've just had with people I've met over dinner or something, and I said to him, by the way, you know, how are you oligarchs gonna go down in Russia? How are you gonna remember? And he said, we're gonna be exactly like the Medici. We're gonna be, we're gonna create great art. We're gonna, we're gonna create a new era. You'll remember us. Um, we're gonna lead dynasties, um, all this kind of stuff. Of course, I put that comment in the book because they never did. <laughs> and, um, and, but, but the Medici were still talking, and the Medici, of course, are in the book. So I'm very lucky, uh, I'm very fortunate to meet all these people, and a lot of them I've put in. Um, and, you know, I knew, I was very lucky I knew Elizabeth II. You know, I met, I met and I, I had dinner with her a couple of times. Um, and so while she was alive, I would never have put in the video, but when, when, she, when she died, um, in the next, in the paperback, the, the slight memory of what it was like to talk to her over dinner. But, I think it's fun to, I'm very lucky that I've known some of these people and seen some of these things. Maybe one more, Sam? Hi, Simon, I'm Sam Haskell. Oh, hi, I know who you are, I, yeah. Um, I could talk to you about the Romanovs all day long. I, I've done a great deal of research and reading about them, and um, I'm anxious to read your book as well. But I do want to ask you a question. You know, those three royal cousins, George V, Nicholas II, and Kaiser Wilhelm, all descendants of Queen Victoria, well, Kaiser uh, Wilhelm and George V were uh, uh, Nicholas married Victoria's daughter. Granddaughter, yeah, Nicholas's granddaughter, yeah. One of the great, uh, granddaughter, one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century was the Romanov assassination, in my opinion. And uh, I'm a loyalist, and I, I thought it was just perfectly horrid. But I've, I've got a question for you that I, I, I don't know if you've been asked before, maybe you have, but. How would Russia be different? How would the world be different had George V granted asylum to Nicholas and his family before the assassination? You know, you're going to be, that's, a, that's a great question. So Sam asks. Um, yeah, Sam asks. He, he, Sam is, is, a, is an expert on the Romanovs and studies the Romanovs and the, um, and the club of, uh, of monarchs that, that were ruling just before World War I and then into World War I, the Kaiser Wilhelm. George V and, um, and Nicholas II. Nicholas II and George V looked identical, almost. Um, and um, and he, he asked, you know, how would it, he, he regards the, the murder of the Tsar and his family as, as a great crime, and, um, and it undoubtedly was a great crime. And he asks, you know, how would life have been different if George V had granted, uh, granted him refuge in England? And it's a, it's a great question. Um, you may be disappointed in my answer, um, uh, because uh, well, well, there's two things to say. I mean, first of all, um, you know they have been overthrown, and I, I actually don't, I think I think the Tsar was utterly discredited politically. Um, you know, he'd he'd completely he completely failed. I mean, he'd been dismissed by his own army, by his own the crowds had taken over Petrograd. But the decisive thing was that you know 
the reason why he fell, which is not often understood, and I like to revisit these questions, is because the Romanov dynasty had always existed um, thanks to the backing of the Guards regiments. Um, and in, in 1905 revolution, for example, you know, the 1905 revolution really, um, when it came down to it, failed for one big reason, and that is because Nicholas II kept the loyalty of the Guards regiments. And, and which enabled him to retake Russia in 1905, which he did. By the way, again, something you don't read in most Nicholas II biographies, he personally supervised this, and he was careful to keep to keep his role in it um, discreet. But he but he did it. He reconquered it pretty brutally, um, pretty brutally. And but what happened in the Brusilov offensive in 1916? The Russians launched a pretty successful uh, uh, offensive against, in 1916 against the Austrians. Um, it was going very well until the Germans came to the Austrians' um, help. And the, and the Russians just kept feeding in troops. And in the process, they fed into the meat grinder the whole guards, all the guards regiments, all the old guards regiments. And, all, and that whole world was destroyed in that. And then, of course, the Germans re, you know, um, attacked back. And so, when the crowd started to protest in February 1917, Nicholas II had no guards. He had no real loyal regiments. I mean, he had some, but nothing like um, the esprit de corps of the guards regiments. And, and, you know, and also he'd lost the, he'd really lost the respect of the army. And this was primarily due not to him taking supreme command of the army, um, which he did in 1915, but because he'd allowed Alexandra to, to um, try to manage the home front, to try to manage the government with him as his helper. And that had been a disaster. She was a spectacularly inept woman in terms of politics. Um, whatever you think of her as a person, and um, you know, taking the advice of Rasputin, who again, whatever you think of him, some people think he was a mystic, uh, some people think he was a fraud, but whatever you think of him, he, was, he turned out to be an extremely unwise person to take political advice from. And that had really lost the, that had really lost the, the, um, the monarchy a lot of respect. And so I think they were a busted flush when they were overthrown in February of 17. Um, they fell into the hands of, of the Bolsheviks, as you know, and that, you know, the Bolsheviks, Lenin, Lenin made the decision to kill them all. Um, a terrible crime. Uh, but, now, George V, <clears throat> it's, well, it's, 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 it's always written about that George V made the decision whether to rescue um, the, the um, Tsar or not. And of course, uh, he had a role in that decision. Um, the plan was, I've been told by members of the royal family, um, that they were, gonna, they, were, they were preparing Balmoral yes. as, his, as his refuge. Um, they already chose the ship. And where he would stay, and there was, and there was, there were all sorts. They'd chosen everything, but what everyone forgets about Britain is, Britain was not ruled by a royal family, and um, the royal, the, the king had really no influence on foreign policy, really at all. Um, the last king who had any real influence on foreign policy was was his father, Edward the Seventh, and him only in a kind of very, very kind of gentle way with the French alliance. But essentially, Lord George. Um, Lord George couldn't make his mind up what to do, but Lord George was the almost dictator of Britain at the time, and um, was the war, war autocrat, uh, elected, uh, the, the elected prime minister, and it didn't really matter what George was. But George V went all, blue hot and cold, as you know. First hot, then cold. But actually it was Lord George's decision, and Lord George decided not to do anything about it. That's the end of it. Did it make any difference? I believe, I believe it didn't make much difference. I mean, he would have had a court in exile, he would have been. A, he would have settled somewhere in England, I believe. Um, he'd have been like Napoleon the Third was, yeah. living in England. Um, we'd have had lots of Romanovs at, um, at our boarding schools and you know, <laughs> in Cambridge. We'd all know them. They'd all be sort of English now. Um, they'd all have gone back. Um, you know, when when the Soviet Union fell. But I don't believe it would have made the slightest bit of difference. But I don't know. That's not I, the answer you wanted to hear. Well, no, I, I appreciate the answer because I I know the fallacies and the reign of Nicholas were great. And I know the harm he brought and the harm that Rasputin brought, but I, I just wondered from your perspective if it would have made any difference in 
what's happening in Russia today had that family lived. You know, they still have a court Romanovs in England of the survivors of the, of the cousins and so forth. Um, but they don't do anything but just have pageantry. Um, it's, it's just always been so interesting to me that the assassination catapulted the country into the strength that it became, I think. But I, I wondered how different it would have been had they not been murdered. I mean, I'm, the, I'm, the bio, I'm a biographer of the, the entire dynasty. So, I know. so I'm, I, I, would, I would be the first to, be, to long to um, long to agree to how important they were. But the moment they left power, they suddenly became much less important. And, um, and I, don't think they'd have, I don't think they'd have made much difference. Okay, I think that's very fair, and I thank you. Thank you. And I thank you. Uh, we're gonna proceed to the signing table. Thank you for that sure. little workout. Thank you, you so that. much. Thank you. Well, to be in this legendary picture, so to meet you. Okay. No, and to be in Mississippi for the first time, so thank you. Yeah.